Welcome to PR Talk, sponsored by the PRSA of Oregon and part of the MPN, the Marketing Podcast Network. This is your host, Amy Rosenberg, founder of Veracity and author of A Modern Guide to Public Relations. Help other people find our podcast by subscribing, rating, giving us a review, or sharing on social media. Hi, PR Talk listeners. This week, we're giving ourselves the day off by not recording an episode, and we're giving you a break from hearing us. <laughs> Instead, we're sharing an episode from the podcast Own It, which is a member of the Marketing Podcast Network. This Own It episode we're playing for you today features Lori Gaffney, CEO of Borders, Perrin, and Norander, a marketing agency that has operated out of Portland, Oregon for more than 40 years. This podcast, Own It, is all about highlighting women and non-binary advertising agency owners because while 40% of businesses are owned by women, this podcast believes, but can't be sure, that less than 1% of the 22,000 advertising agencies in North America are owned by women and non-binary people. In this episode, learn how Lori Gaffney owns it. Hi, and welcome to the Own It Podcast, where we celebrate the growing number of women and non-binary ad agency owners and talk about buying out of the Boys Club of Advertising one agency at a time. I'm Christy Heiler, owner of Cornette, and today we're talking to Lori Gaffney of Borders Pair and Norander, BPN. Previously on Own It, we've talked to agency owners who came up through strategy or creative. Lori's a bit of a rare breed in that she came up through the media side of the business. But she's been an inspiring and successful leader in advertising for 40 years across all aspects of the industry. Lori talked about an interesting challenge in agency ownership that we all need to think more about, which is pay equity. She also shared her challenges with imposter syndrome. A lot of us fight that self-doubt. Lori offered some sage advice to win that battle. I had so much fun learning from Lori, and I know you will too. Here's my conversation with Lori Gaffney. Hey, Lori. Hi, Christy. How are you? I'm good. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast today to chat about the ad industry, ownership, and what we can do together to see more women step into this role. Yeah. I've been really looking forward to this as well. Okay. Before we talk about business, I'd love to get to know you a little bit. What do you love to do outside of work? As a proud Kentuckian, You know, I am also a proud University of Oregon graduate. Yes, I am a duck. So Oregon still has a little piece of my heart. So make me jealous, Lori. Tell me about the incredible things you're doing out there in Oregon. Well, we're outside all year long, regardless if it's raining or snowing. I'm out walking with my friends. We don't even think twice about it. And we love it. So I do a lot of that. Um, I spend a lot of time with my husband. We are empty nesters. Uh, our kids have been gone for a long time, so it's great to spend time with him. I love to entertain. I love to cook. I could, my happiest days are staying in the kitchen all day long, making a huge mess and then cleaning it up and having a delicious dinner. I love having folks over. So the pandemic was a little bit rough because we weren't able to do that. But um, yeah, I'd love to bake. That's kind of a newish thing. Uh, I was always a little scared of baking. It was too precise for me, but I have actually come to really like that. So yeah, that's what I do in my spare time. I love that you said um, you're outside, rain or shine. It's funny. I've told people this a lot. I never owned an umbrella when I lived in, or it rains nine months out of the year, but I never owned an umbrella and I rode my bike everywhere. Like I was outdoors all the time. So wild. Yeah. We use umbrellas a little bit more now. For some reason, we do have some of those terrible showers. Like if you were to go somewhere, you probably would want to take an umbrella, Mm -hmm. but for the most part, they're in the trunk and that's that Mm -hmm. you just throw on your hood and you run in and you know, you get a little wet. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it makes everything so beautiful out there. Yeah, it's really pretty. Lori, I've been asking this recently. Are there any women past or present that you've looked up to or have really inspired you at certain points of your life? 
I would have to say my mother for sure, because she, most of my life, she was single. She was very hardworking. She was a bookkeeper, but she also bought um, a lot of apartment buildings. So on the weekends we would go and scrape paint and paint them and get them ready for renters to come in. So she was always busy. She um, very, very independent, but crazy supportive. And the thing I love about her most, and I think I got a little bit of this from her is the, how fair she was to everyone. So we would have a lot of workers around a lot of times she'd make lunch for everybody. Everybody was treated equally. I mean, if you, to a person, she's been gone now for a while, but to a person, people would say, look, I'm getting all choked up. They was um, just how fair she, everybody was welcome. Everybody was welcome in our house. And if you didn't like that someone else was there, then you had to leave. Like that's the way, those are the rules. And mixed all different kinds of people together. I have a lot of friends that maybe compartmentalize people in their life. I mix everybody together. And and I really got that from her. And also just what I love is that, you know, she was tough and she had a lot of grit and she had a lot of adversity that she had to overcome, but she was loving and she loved her husband. (laughs) There were a few. (laughs) She loved her husband and she loved just having a a warm and loving home. And I think Mm -hmm. of my age, a lot of the women that I either worked with either did one or the other, you know, they were really great at work, but they didn't really have that home thing figured out. And she had that really nice balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I would say her. And, And in terms of work, I didn't have a lot of women role models because there just weren't, there just weren't all my bosses were men. And I, I, I think about this a lot and I think, wow, they're just really, they really weren't. Your background is really interesting coming up through media. I've talked to a lot of creative and strategy leads, uh, but not a lot of folks on the media side that have journeyed <laughs> where their path has led them or that they have gone themselves, walked into ownership. How did you come into the advertising business and take us through your journey? Okay. So I thought I wanted to be an elementary school teacher and everything I did in my first few years of college was geared around becoming an elementary school teacher. I was a camp counselor. I did a lot of tutoring. I just, a lot of things with elementary school children. And then one day, and I honestly, I don't even know what the trigger was. I said, I don't want to do this. I think it was the more I got into the classroom and I saw, you know, the parent teacher relationship and the fact that these people weren't making it many money. And, you know, I just, I got a little sour and I said, okay, what am I going to do? And at the same time I was transferring to Boston university, I was in Los Angeles and I applied first for elementary school um, education. And then I flipped about two months before I went and I said, Nope, I want to be in communication. I want to study advertising. And I don't know, I really don't know why, but that program was fantastic. BU has a great advertising program and it was very, very practical. And I was always, whenever we were in these teams, I was always the media person, which was kind of funny. Um, But I just loved it because I loved like the understanding the people and how they receive messages. And I liked the numbers, but I also always appreciated that it was creative if you wanted it to be, and I always wanted it to be. So to graduate, we had to have an internship. And I did my summer internship um, at Shiat Day in 1981. Wow. And so I worked there for three months. I had one more semester because since I had changed um, majors, I had to go an extra semester. And when I graduated, they hired me right away in the media department in LA. And in, in the 80s at Shiat Day in LA was pretty special. It was a really special time. Um, you know, and what made it special? Well, Jay was there. Um, there were no agencies that were based in Los Angeles at the time. They were either in Chicago or in uh, New York. And so we were a little bit off the beaten path. You know, sales reps would come to me and they say, yeah, that's great. You're working on Shia Day. But if you were working at a real agency in New York, things would be different. And they always sort of said that. But then Shia Day started making a name for themselves. They did the Apple commercial in 84. Like, and things were just, it was a very exciting time to be there. The work was amazing. Jay was very, very generous. He was 
really, really tough, but he was very, very generous. And, you know, he just, he just wanted to do great things. And so then in 84, I moved to New York to be with my boyfriend, who's now my husband of 37 years. But, um, and I went to go work for a real agency in New York, even though Shia Day said, why don't you come over? They were just starting their New York office. And I said, no, I, I want to, if I'm going to New York, I'm going to, I'm working at a big agency. So I went to Ted Bates and they were based in Times Square at the time. And in the eighties in Times Square it was not quite like it is today. Um, but I would, you know, wear my Reeboks to the office and I put on my big girl shoes and I was at a big job, but um, it was kind of awful. It was kind of awful. There were 300 people in the media department. They had, um, I think like, 1800 people in the office. And it, I had come from a place where we were really independent. We had our own PCs. We were like, you know, or uh, Max, I guess at the time. And um, just, you know, nimble and fun. And this was like everything that wasn't. <laughs> and, but it was a great experience because I, and I still have friends from that time, but Shai Day kept calling me for, from New York and saying, okay, don't you want to come now? I said, no, I'm not a big, big agency, you know? And then finally eight months in, I said, I, I hate it. Yes, I'm coming. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. So then I went and worked at Shai Day New York for a couple of years. Then we moved back to LA, always in media. Um, and then in the early nineties, we decided to move to, to Portland for my husband's job. We had just had two little kids and LA was getting a little crowded. And so we moved and I said, well, I'm either going to work at Widening Kennedy or I'm just going to stay home with my kids. Like, that's all I thought that I could do. But then I got the job at Widening Kennedy before I even left L.A. and ran the Nike business there and the media it was great, except, you know, it wasn't very family friendly. Mm -hmm. So I made a switch in the late 90s over to Borders, which was great because they, you know, appreciated work-life balance. Um, you know, for the first time I was home a lot with my kids and they were, you know, starting junior high and it was, it was, it was great. And we had good clients. We worked with Columbia Sportswear um, and Valvoline and, you know, national accounts and we were doing great work. And then in uh, 2012, oh, I became a partner when I got there in 2012, I became the president. So which was crazy. And the only reason why we had six partners at one time, at this point, we're down to three and the other two are creative people and nobody wanted to be president. So they said, why don't you just be president? So. <laughs> yeah. I read that you called your move into ownership accidental. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. So then I became the, then I became the president in 2012, which for me it was a big stretch because here I had been a, a specialist for so, so long and, you know, three decades. And now I have to be a generalist and it was great because my kids were gone and it was fun to pivot to something new and challenging. And at the same time, it was super scary and uh, talk about imposter syndrome. I had it really bad, um, but I weathered through it. Um, and then in 2014, there was just another partner and myself and he wanted to retire and he said, and he was, he owned a lot more than I did. And he just said, at the end of the year, I'm leaving and you know, it's yours. I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> and I hadn't, I hadn't really ever thought that I would own an agency never in a million years, but it just kind of happened. And I don't even think I thought about it as much as maybe I should have thought about what that would mean, but I was running the agency at that point. Um, so anyway, my first year was really bad. The agency was now 38 years old and I had some personal things go on. And anyway, it just in November, I had to have a big layoff. I felt like the whole entire universe was working against me. But in the end, with some space now, I I can tell you that I actually think the universe was working for me because I think mm. it was time for me to get a jolt and say, 
You are the owner of this place. You can make it what you want it to be. You can have the people working here that you want working here. I didn't feel that permission when I first took over because I had always had a boss and I just hadn't had that kind of um, responsibility. And so it was, it was great. So 2016, it was a little bit of a riding the ship year. And then since then, we've just been on a great trajectory. And I would say we have wonderful people. We became a B Corp or obviously woman owned. Um, 80% of our leadership team are, is female. Um, 26% of our staff are people of color. So we've been working really hard to mm-hmm. make it the kind of place where where, yeah, frankly, where I want to work. <laughs> so, and get the right kind of clients. We've said goodbye to clients that we are have t- turned out to not be a good fit. You know, that's always a really scary thing because there's financial implications to that. But um, in the end, your, your team trusts you more for making those decisions. And you know what? It works out. Somehow mm-hmm. I just keep thinking mm-hmm. it's going to work out, you know, and uh, you just got to keep moving forward. Ruth Bernstein, who owns the yard NYC, Mm -hmm. she, I just um, had an interview with her recently and she said, um, I can't remember where she got it, but it stuck with her, um, this saying, good news, bad news, who knows, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that that's kind of like what you're saying, you know, like, and I had thought about it a lot of times, like things just work out the way that they should. But I do think that to your point, like it it may have seemed like bad news, but who knows, it actually could be good news, you know, and, and vice versa. Sometimes good news, who knows, it may be good, but it, you know, you just don't know where things, you know, are always going to lead. But a lot of times that good news can surprise you. And sometimes the bad news can surprise you too, um, and turn into some good things. Let's talk about the biggest challenges that you faced in owning an agency. And then we'll talk about the joys. Yeah. But the biggest challenge I think is just making sure you have the right talent. I think that's, that's a big part of it. I mean, obviously there's the always needing to get new business and and financial part of running a business is, is very challenging. But I also think that if you have the right people and you're focused on the right things, that, you know, good things will come from it. So even these challenges that we have, sometimes if if you're having a financial challenge and you pull your team and you're like, guys, we got to we got to pull this through. It's amazing how that can be turned around into Mm -hmm. something so much better, you know. So, yeah, I, I don't feel like. I'm burdened by tons of challenges right now. I mean, certainly there was times like back in 2015 and 2016, I certainly felt like that. But now I feel like because we're focused on our values and who we want to work with and who we don't want to work with and the decisions that we're making and pay equity. I mean, that's always a challenge, pay equity. Right now, I worry a little bit about that because the new people that are coming in are getting pretty good salaries. and. You know, I need to make sure that it's equitable with the people that have been there already. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't keep raising, 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 right? So I have always lived by the notion that if the salary sheet fell on the ground, that nobody would be surprised. Mm -hmm. I never want anyone to be surprised because frankly, I have had it happen to me twice in my career and it's an awful feeling. You know, it's an awful feeling to be told, well, the reason he makes more money than you, even though you manage more people and manage more money is because his wife stays home, right? I get it. His wife stays home, but that's not why I should make less. Mm-hmm. So that is a little bit of a challenge of recent is is new people coming in and, and getting more money than than maybe they would the have job gotten. market. Yeah. 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 It's fierce for sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's probably a little bit about it. <laughs> what about the joys? The joys ah, and ownership. There's so many joys. There's so many joys. There's so the joys to me are just seeing the people that I work with their faces and trying to give them opportunities and being there to support them and prop them up. And like that is my and maybe it comes back to like wanting to be an elementary school teacher. I don't mm-hmm. know. But just like really why wanting to see people thrive and grow and do great work and be successful. 
it really, I, a lot of the joy comes from the people for me. Yeah. I mean, I love the work too. Don't get me wrong. I, it's not like I'm not in advertising. I am in advertising and I do like the work and I do the joy. Another big joy is, and we say this a lot is if the client loves the work and we love the work, we're winning. You know, that moment you've had it, everyone that's had an agency, you have it. And it you don't get it all the time. Sometimes the client loves work and you're like, uh, it's not exactly what we had wanted or vice versa. So like, I, I thought we always say that if, you know, if they love it and we love it, then, then we're winning. And there is that, that does bring a lot of joy also. Mm-hmm. Lori, why do you think that there are so few female owners in our business? You mentioned, and I really, it's like, it's so hard to hear for me when people say they've had that experience where they are told that they're not going to be paid equally. I mean, you know, there, there are real experiences of inequities. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that there are so few female owners? I mean, this is a, that's a really big inequity, 1% Mm -hmm. of agencies. So 99% of all the agencies in this business are owned by men when 40% of general, just, you know, businesses in general in the U S are owned by women. That's a big disparity. It has just been dominated. I mean, I've been doing this for 40 years. It has just been dominated by the boys club forever. And then those giant holding companies, if you look at at the roster, you know, so many men on top. And I think that just in general, women sort of have less confidence than men as you're growing up, you know, but I am really optimistic because I see this new generation of women coming through that have tremendous confidence. We've done a lot to to give girls confidence growing up these days, which I think is fantastic, whether it's through sport or, or however we support them. And things are changing. And not only that, like, look at how many CMOs are women now. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's been such a change. And so I'm optimistic that women are going to start supporting women-owned businesses. I mean, I already see that happening. I see when I say to somebody, you know, I'm a woman-owned business, they kind of go, oh, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so so why has it happened? It's just legacy, I think. Mm-hmm. And I love that you said that you feel like we are supporting younger women better. What does that look like? What do you think women in our business need to need in order to feel supported, whether they're young or not? Well, I think they need a seat at the table. I think they need to be heard. Um, But again, you know, like when I think about the young, talented women in in my agency, you know, they're not afraid to to speak their mind at all, at all. (laughs) And and I find that really fantastic. I don't always agree, but I, I definitely appreciate that they that they do have a voice. And I also think flexibility. And I also think that when you see more women rise to higher positions in companies, whether they're CMOs or they're owning agencies or what, whatever it is, I mean, I do think women are, are getting much more opportunity today, certainly than they did when I first started. Um, I think that you know, women are going to treat women. They understand like you need flexibility when you have children. When I worked at Whited, I loved working at Whited. I love the work I did, but man, I would work until two in the morning and be back there at seven. And I had two young children at home. I mean, it was rough. It was really, really rough. Um, I don't think that's happening as much anymore. You know, I think people are realizing that you know, I could go home and put my kids to sleep and do some work and maybe take them to school and feel like a a more balanced person and be more effective for the hours that I actually am at work. So I think how are we going to do it? We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna be role models for these women. We're gonna give them a seat at the table. We're going to give them the flexibility that they need because I don't know what the number is of, I mean, I know what the number is of agency owners to general market women owners, but like, I don't know what the numbers are of women who still sort of take the lead in the home. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I'm, I know that's changing too. And man, I was super lucky. I had a really fantastic, you know, support system here with my husband, but, you know, I think that there's still a lot of the burden falls on the mom. And so giving them flexibility and understanding that, you know, they always say like, you want something done, give it to a busy person. Women know how to get a lot of shit done. Mm -hmm. They do. They know how to multitask. They know how to, to get stuff done. And, uh, and I think that there's also kind of a little more, no bullshit. You know, it's not a bro club. It's, it's like, we got to get it done. Let's go Mm -hmm. get it done. So let's talk about that self-doubt though, because I know you mentioned that you felt like you had some imposter syndrome um, when you stepped into the position of leadership and ownership. Mm -hmm. And do you, well, let me start by asking, I know you said that you feel like this next generation, they have more confidence. Do you feel like there is that, any of that self-doubt or what can we do to help remove that self-doubt? What do you do even personally when you're in those moments of self-doubt to like, to really build yourself up? I, I, um, one, one owner that I talked to talked about having, you know, several types of mentors, you know, the mentor mm-hmm. that's like, just going to cheer you on, you know, rah, rah. And then there's, the type that's going to be willing to have that hard conversation with you though, that you need, you know, that you really need um, multiple types of people around you, you know, as Mm -hmm. you move into leadership and you move into especially ownership, because um, I do think as I think Carol Williams put it, as you, the higher you climb, you know, the fewer the people are going to be up there. So, Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? But I still Um, think that we can have community, you know, um, but what is, what does that look like to you? How can we, how can we get out of that place of self-doubt? Something I I think a lot of us struggle with sometimes. Um, I was working with someone and she said, you just got to say, I am enough. I am enough, you know, and not it's just, I mean, I can't even tell you how many times in my career where you're in a room and you say something and no one pays attention. And then the guy next to you says it's the same thing. And all of a sudden it's like the second coming, you're like, wait a minute, I just said that, you know? Mm-hmm. And so how do you not have doubt? Then you start not talking, right? Because you're not being heard. So I think that, that those two things kind of go together a lot, like being heard and then, you, you know, I think it helps you get over some of that self-doubt because you're just like, no, I I am enough. I do have good ideas. I can, um, you know, make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so all those things I think contribute to you being able to tamp down some of that self-doubt. And so I think if we can do that for the next gen, (laughs) Mm-hmm. of women that are coming through and saying, I, I, I hear you. Like I, I was saying, you, like, I hear you. Mm-hmm. Right. You're not in the corner being quiet. Oh, getting the coffee. Believe me, that happened a lot in my career Laura, you go get the coffee. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I think that, um, again, I'm very optimistic mm-hmm. about the future. It's, it's just, I just keep thinking that it's the legacy of this business and it's prime to change. I think it's prime to change. Mm-hmm. Me too. Because I think if it doesn't, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem for companies. I think, you know, every day, if you look in the trades, some woman is being promoted to some elevated position every single day. So it's just going to take a little bit of time. Mm-hmm. But It's good. Yeah. And I said from the beginning, my hope really is that we can close the gap by a lot, by just having the conversation and just shifting that conversation from end goal being leadership to end goal being ownership, you know, Mm -hmm. like you, because for me, that, that ownership piece is really critical, you know, the wealth piece and transfer of wealth and ultimate decision-making. And also I think being able to feel the weight and you know, like the true weight, you feel the weight, right? Let's talk about that. What is the difference? 
Laura, you, like me, you, you stepped into that leadership. You were running it before you owned it. What's the difference between leadership and ownership? Uh, that first year, I felt like I had bricks on my chest because I was looking at the money and I was looking at the future and I was looking at the team and all of it was like not going in the right direction. And then there was a time where I could barely even, I have a wonderful financial person. I was like, I don't even want to look at the numbers. Just tell me what I need to worry about because it was so daunting. You know, this business is hard. It's very hard. And there is a big difference. There is a difference when you know that to me, supporting my employees, they're buying houses, they're having children, they're counting on me to keep this business you know, vital. And so that, that's a lot of responsibility. So ownership, I mean, it is tough. I think maybe if I had a partner and make it a little bit easier, but I also kind of like running the show. Mm -hmm. Lori, what advice do you have for those who will follow you and going out on their own, especially in media? I'd love to see more people from the media side coming in well, there's ownership. So crazy. I don't, I mean, if there's 1% of female agency owners, there's probably like, I don't know, 0.0001% that came up through media as a, for a full service agency, creative people are a little scared of that idea because they think that it would make the work more boring or too data driven. But having worked at Shia Day and at Wyden and Kennedy, arguably the best creative agencies in the world, certainly at the times that I was there, they totally appreciated the value of media. They knew that those creative ideas were not going to come alive unless the media department pushed really hard to make the first 90 second spot on MTV or painting walls or whatever, wherever it was, there were so many firsts. And I think that a lot of a lot these days, the the media and the creative are siloed. And I I think that the smarter agencies are realizing how important they are. And I think to have someone that is analytical and really caring about how the work is being received, running the show, it makes a difference. I have a terrific ECD. He's so smart. He's so creative. And yet he is fine with me giving input and, you know, sort of sussing out how this message is going to be received and like really talking it through. So it's not just the creative, but it's the creative and media combined. And I think it's great. I think Mm -hmm. no one should be afraid of that. I would say that there are opportunities for, for women media folks to go and, and, and run a creative agency. But I kind of think that you have to, you have to really be around a creative agency and you have to appreciate that media and creative are inextricably linked. And I don't know that that happens a lot. There's still a lot of silos where media is on one end of the room and, you know, creatives on the other and it's, they're not, they're not linked, but when they are linked, the work is really great. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that there's even fewer from the media side stepping into ownership? Again, a, a little bit legacy. It was a support. Mm. It was support. I mean, certainly when I started it, you know, except for the fact that I was at Chiat Day, which they really did care. I, I mean, media always had a seat at the table. But in a lot of these big agencies, you know, they, they have the big media, you know, holding company, and then they have the creatives over here. And, you know, they just, it's, I think it's just not seen as priority. Well, you're proof. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good move. <laughs> well, thank you, Lori. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Own It with Lori Gaffney of Borders Pier and Norander. Learn more about her agency at bpninc.com. Make sure to connect with her on LinkedIn as well. If you're enjoying Own It, please subscribe, then rate and share it on your podcast service of choice. Also, if you're a female or non-binary agency owner, or you want to own an agency someday, join our growing community at IntilYouOwnIt.com. I'm Christy Heiler. We'll talk again soon on Own It. Thanks for listening. 
For more PR insight, be sure to check out Amy's book, A Modern Guide to Public Relations at prtalk.co. Also, please subscribe, rate, or leave us a review.